Ciao. So nice to see you again. How are you feeling this morning? Did you sleep? I'm so glad. I'm so glad, and I'm very much looking forward to today. Um, we have a, a very interesting morning planned, starting off with uh, Professor Burton's lecture, and then we'll engage in these cross-cutting themes, and then get back together in our groups, and then uh, we'll have lunch and come back together for a final wrap-up. I know some of you are leaving this afternoon, and uh, some, some leaving when? Tomorrow? Okay, okay, good. Well, uh, it's, it's my great uh, honor and pleasure to introduce you to a, a phenomenal scholar uh, and a person that my family and I have the pleasure of being neighbors with. We're, uh, we're neighbors with Professor Burton. Uh, Antoinette Burton is the Bastian Professor of Global and Transnational Studies in the Illinois Department of History. She's also the director of the Illinois Program for Research in the Humanities, where she provides campus-wide leadership related to, well, humans and how humans engage the world. Professor Burton is a historian of 19th and 20th century Britain and its extensive and often brutal empire. She's been an incredibly productive and influential scholar. She's a, part of a small group of, of uh, scholars who have crafted a new way of understanding the British Empire, rescuing it from what some have called the white man's model of imperial history. By demonstrating the impact of women, gender, race, and sexuality uh, in the British colonial history, her work has shaped our understanding of imperialism and has important implications for America today. She's incredibly productive. Ideas and books spew forth from her like water out of the Buckingham Fountain in Chicago. <laughs> She's the sole author of seven books, the editor of at least 16 more. She's the author of more than 30 peer-reviewed articles and has more chapters than I could count this morning. She's the editor of two book series, and she's the winner of a very prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship. At a time when much of the dialogue in higher education and primary education in the United States focuses almost exclusively on STEM, Professor Burton's work reminds us of the centrality of the humanities in all important endeavors. That's why I'm so happy that you're here to speak with us this morning. In fact, your talk has been on my mind a lot. And this morning, on my bike ride over here, this little rhyme came to my mind. Please forgive me. Her name is Antoinette Burton, and she's put on a hurtin' to them old, dead, bald, white men. She's a neighbor of mine. She's won a Guggenheim for calling to our attention things that were never mentioned by women, gender, and race. That we'll learn from her is certain. This ain't about flirting. Please join with me in welcoming Antoinette Burton. <laughs> I can even talk now. Um, thank you so much. And it's really a great pleasure and honor to be here. And I'd like to thank all the organizers of the, uh, organizers of the conference, Retu, for inviting me, and also Erica for working so hard to make sure all the moving parts come together. Um, I am, in fact, the director of the Illinois Program for Research in the Humanities, which, as Bill has suggested, is the Humanities Center on Campus. And um, so I stand before you representing the wealth of interdisciplinary and collaborative research that we do um, in the humanities on campus with all kinds of partners. And my remarks today will sort of reflect my two years now in that position and um, what, it, what I think it means to um, think about the work of the humanities in shaping smart, sustainable innovation. So four academics are sitting in an auditorium for a conference when suddenly the lights go out, no one panics, but some conversation ensues. The philosopher says, this blackout raises a series of epistemological questions. What is light 
And how does it really illuminate the question of how to live the examined life? The English professor says, as we sit in the dark, I am reminded of the great moral dilemmas that the novelist Herman Melville illustrated for readers as Captain Ahab looked out into the darkness over the bow of his whaling ship, the Pequod, seeking vengeance on Moby Dick. The historian says, you know, since the 1930s, when the Works Progress Administration fanned out to build roads and other public works, the infrastructure in this country has never been ready, really properly updated, which may explain why the grids are so easily overloaded, especially in the precinct of the crumbling public research university. <laughs> Meanwhile, the engineer says nothing. She has already left the stage, gone to the basement, flipped the circuit breaker, and turned the lights on. <laughs> I begin with this anecdote because it captures, I think, the stereotypes that have attached to the differences between humanists and STEM faculty and practitioners in the American Academy and beyond today. That is, it plays on commonly held views of the way that humanists think and engineers act, or it casts humanists as merely thinkers and engineers as bold agents who apply their knowledge, in this case common sense, but also a fix-it mentality, to solving actual real-world problems. These are caricatures, obviously, and I apologize for reproducing them. A rhetorician would call it hyperbole, a Greek word meaning throwing beyond the limit, in this case, exaggeration or overstatement for effect, usually with the intent to provoke wider reflection. That's what I hope to do here in my time this morning, to provoke some reflection on how and why humanities research, teaching, and ways of knowing are not just useful thinking about smart, sustainable innovation, but are absolutely indispensable to how we work to make that kind of innovation happen now. There's a very powerful case for the work of humanities scholarship in the world that is decades old. The argument goes like this. Philosophers, literature professors, scholars of religions and world cultures, we all think and work in two registers. First and foremost, we are content experts. We know what Aristotle said and thought about ethics, physics, and metaphysics. We know the full range of human narrative capabilities from the ancient epic to the contemporary novel and beyond. We've been in archives that backlight everything from the rise of the Mongol Empire to the experience of the Middle Passage to the emergence of the modern automobile and so much more. There is hardly a corner of existing human experience that humanists have not thought about or investigated, at least preliminarily, and about which they cannot speak knowledgeably, deeply, purposefully, and thoughtfully. That depth of content knowledge is an amazing thing, a wealth of knowledge available for students and practitioners to draw on in all kinds of contexts. As humanists, we believe that knowledge is a good in itself, a public good. It stretches the mind, takes us out of our specific times and places, encourages us to consider civic values and to remember that we are citizens in a connective tissue of social, economic, religious, political, and cultural environments on a global scale. In its best forms, humanity, scholarship, and teaching is predicated on interdependence, the connectivity of all things and the power of their conductivity, not just in the world, but between worlds as well. But the knowledge that humanists cultivate can and is also routinely applied to all manner of grand challenges and problems, past, present, and future. So for example, if you're building a new bioengineering-based um, medical college, as we are on this campus, and as Dean Kingley well knows, you need to sediment humanities into the very roots of that curricular edifice. You need medical students to understand and appreciate the social, political, and cultural context in which they're practicing medicine from the history of the modern medical establishment itself, to literatures on pain and death and dying, to the cultural context which give rise to myths, for example, about how people of color feel more or less pain than whites. You need to know that this myth, a working assumption of many medical practitioners, is not, as some believe, the basis for enlightened medical practice, in part because it stems from 18th century slaveholding ideologies in the Americas, something only access to deep knowledge of the history of medicine will tell you. In order to be a competent ethical doctor, you need a broad range of humanistic knowledge and you need specific exposure to training in ethics, history, and literature. In fact, there is a whole branch of medical humanities devoted to narrative medicine, for example, 
which is designed to help doctors in training appreciate how dependent they are on what patients tell them about their symptoms and how they can learn to navigate different, different narrative strategies when it comes to eliciting patient histories in aid of proper and appropriate treatment. This is an example of the ways that expert humanities research and knowledge is indispensable beyond either just ideas or the undergraduate classroom per se. As is also well known, the work of the humanities in the world is rooted in specific ways of knowing and thinking. Critical modes of analysis and investigation that move innovation and discovery forward precisely because they are grounded in multimodal forms of interpretation and reasoning that take us beyond the problem itself to the larger environments in which problems live and from which the challenges we seek to meet them emerge. Here I want to stop and underscore, humanists do not simply approach problems with their toolkit of knowledge and skills. They ask from the start, who framed that problem as a problem? How did it emerge, how did it emerge as such? What are the genealogies and forms of expression and philosophical assumptions that produce what looks like a problem to us? They ask, by whom has this problem been constituted and to whom does it matter? How and why, in other words, did those lights go out in the first place? Because even if we can turn them back on, as our able engineer did, we need to know why. Or to paraphrase the feminist poet Adrian Rich, how, when, and under what conditions is anything ever a problem? And where do we see it from, is the question. Humanists think context is important. They understand the complexity of human systems and representations of them. They respect the broad and deep traditions and histories out of which social structures are produced, language is shaped, forms of expression get coded, and ideologies are mobilized. To be sure, not every single humanist works from a root cause, and humanists are hardly all the same, but they do share a broad commitment to looking beyond the surface, and they are alive not simply to multiple origins or contexts, but to, way, to the ways in which those contexts shape past and current realities. They have a certain degree of skepticism that the way things look or are accounted for is the way things are, and as importantly, a skepticism about how they should be, according to technocrats, both in the university and outside it as well. Here again, that anecdote I opened with is germane. That engineer, she solved the problem, she went to the source, and she flipped the circuit breaker, and she made the lights come on. Big round of applause for her. But all kidding aside, she fixed the problem from within the problem itself, rather than going to root causes or durable structures that caused the lights to go out in the first place. She went for the technological fix. And as brilliant and transformative as technology can be, we know that the STEM solution alone is never the sole solution or even the end of the story. As Albert Einstein said, no worthy problem is ever solved within the plane of its original conception. And here I want to be quite clear. What humanists do to contribute to broader conversations about today's grand challenges is to provide expert knowledge that deepens our appreciations for solutions to those challenges. But humanists also use their critical thinking and investigative skills to trouble and challenge the problems themselves. How has climate change come to be framed as deniable? What are the medieval or early modern origins of a rapacious globalization that seems to be a product of the 20th century, but in fact has patterns and routes going back through centuries, including, of course, through Taiwan. Why do the lights go off disproportionately in third world countries, and how do deep cultures of segregation, poverty, and illiteracy shape the way we think about transforming those landscapes and ours? You can all no doubt think of myriad similar, similar examples stemming from your own work and research interests, and it won't surprise you to hear me say that if you're not already actively collaborating with humanists, you should be. That collaboration has to start from the very beginning of your project, at the moment when the research questions are being identified and framed, and before the problem you are working on actually gets calcified as a problem. My experience of directing our Humanities Center on this STEM campus has made me cautious, skeptical even, about the way that humanists are invited onto research projects, especially those that entail big federal or external funding. Too often we are asked to join in once the proposal has been written, the work plans have been drawn up, 
the sites chosen. In other words, humanists are often seen as complementary to the work at hand rather than constitutive of it. Each and every one of the subjects you all are preoccupied with at this conference, air and water quality, health aging and urban environments, built environment and health, urban agriculture and food security, biomedical and cancer research, mobility and autonomous connected vehicles. Each one is embedded in a set of social, cultural, political, linguistic, cosmological, and historical contexts that merit consideration from the get-go. The extent to which this is true will differ in each case, of course. Humanists are typically not universalists, but respecters of plural and distributed forms of knowledge. And I am sure that the investigators of urban ag and food security and biomedical and cancer research are alive to the dynamic social and cultural context in which they work and out of which the very questions they are answering come. At least I hope you are. Think, if you must, of humanist contributions to such projects as insurance, as risk management. Because frankly, the chances of long-term success and sustainability are far greater for any experiment or research project if the very premises of the project are subject to interrogation and if the human context and dimension are baked in from the very start. There is a presumption here, of course, that human and environmental flourishing is the goal, rather than, say, pure technological progress or profit for its own sake. Humanists have done plenty of work on those subjects, and it's not pretty, as the current catastrophic state of our disastrous world testifies. So what I am saying is harness the powerful combination of humanist expertise and critical thinking and make some real, long-lasting, sustainable change in your fields. By way of winding up, I want to offer some concrete examples of how humanists are combining their expert knowledge and critical thinking skills to work collaboratively and with great interdisciplinary vigor on projects that dovetail with many of the issues you are thinking about here in your conference. Significantly, the work I'm about to showcase comes out of an initiative called Humanities Without Walls. The name suggests a breakout mentality among humanists who want to exceed their disciplinary remit and engage the broad spectrum of collaborative possibilities, even as they remain grounded in their own expertise and skills. These are projects, that is, where humanists drive the agenda, shape the problems from the outset, and invite social scientists and STEM scholars into the project design and execution when and where they may be needed. Funded for five years by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, Humanities Without Walls, or HWW as we call it, is housed at Illinois and is uh, part of a 15-partner consortium that includes the major public research one universities from Nebraska to Penn State, west to east, and along the Prairie Corridor, south from Havana to uh, Michigan as well. I'm going to give you a sampling of the 40 or so projects that HWW has going now that model the kind of practically worldly humanities work that we frankly need across the board in higher education today, both locally and globally. These featured projects are drawn from the first research cycle of HWW, whose theme was the global Midwest. So that's some information on the um, actual humanities without walls. And I think these slides are available, Erica, right in the end. Um, the first um, project I want to talk about is called The Great Lakes and the Global Midwest, led by Rachel Haverlock, professor of English at the University of Illinois at Chicago. You can read the, um, the text there. The argument of the project is not merely a feature of geography. The Great Lakes contain one of the world's most significant shares of fresh water, a resource necessary to almost every human endeavor and one that faces a number of perils. Is the water in the Great Lakes a global resource? Should, it, should its use be restricted to the populations on its shores and connected watersheds? What limits should be placed on the extraction rates of private companies? What role should private companies take in updating antiquated water infrastructure? How can local governments and citizen groups balance investment needs, access to basic services, and resource protection? What are different ways of knowing about the socio-ecological cycles in the Great Lakes, and how might re-readings of social and landscape histories illuminate new understandings of justice in Great Lakes water management? I think you can see by that series of questions um, what the work of humanists does to position a problem like 
uh, the Great Lakes and water management. The next example is a project um, called The Earth Will Not Abide, originally interestingly called Fields, Hand, Plows, and Shares um, by uh, a professor of art and design in our own uh, university, Ryan Griffiths. Uh, and you can read the um, text there, but I want to share the argument. Large swaths of land across North and South America, the eco-regions of the Brazilian Cerrado, the Pampas of Argentina, and the U.S. grassland prairies are dominated by an increasingly limited variety of plants, such as corn and soy, and a relatively small number of people. These three landscapes are at once distinct ecologies shaped by planetary forces of climate and geology, and also symbiotic organs in the global body of commodity circulation. Shaped by a combination of geologic and social forces, these political ecologies have been engineered to complement industrial mechanisms that operate at every imaginable scale, from the molecular production of specialized seeds to the planetary organization of satellite guidance systems and petroleum-powered distribution networks. Despite the sheer size of both indus the industry and the land it exploits, both remain largely invisible and obscure. This project explores the questions, how have expansive and ecologically rich regions of the Western Hemisphere come to be dominated by monocultures? How can we understand the rapid transformations in land use, biological diversity, and social structures wrought by those monocultures? How do the analytical tools of political ecology allow us to visualize and critique our subject while also pointing us in the direction of viable responses? Again, I think you can hear the character of the questioning, the kind of interdisciplinary research, the objects of inquiry, which may look very familiar to you, monoculture, ecosystems, soy, and corn, and yet are framed in a very broad, um, interdependent, interdisciplinary, humanistic, centered kind of questioning. Third of four that I'm going to share with you um, is a project entitled African Im Immigrants and the Production of the Global Midwest, Detroit and the Twin Cities, led by Nancy Rose Hunt, who at the time of the grant was a professor of history at the University of Michigan. And you can see the abstract there. The argument is African immigrants and humanitarian institutions devoted to them have reshaped two cities in the global Midwest since the 1980s a phenomenon our project explores by systematically comparing African immigration to Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Detroit. From the Vietnam War through today's emergent Ebola dynamics, these two American urban zones have had radically divergent histories of immigration, racial dynamics, humanitarian options, and forms of reconfigured blackness. Through oral history and ethnographic research, we aim to document and compare how African migrants have reshaped neighborhoods, institutions, infrastructures, and the economies of these cities since accelerated global flows began in 1989. Our focus in the project is twofold. First, we take account of how Afri African migration has intensified since the late 1980s and track the upsurge of provisioning charitable, humanitarian, human rights, and refugee services in the urban Midwest. Secondly, to avoid approaching our research subjects through a human humanitarian eye alone as needy victims, a strong share of our research will consider Africans through their forms of social capital and enterprise. Again, very compelling questions for this group. Um, pivoted from the beginning on a variety of humanistic-centered, um, interdependent, interdisciplinary questions. Last but not least, um, a project called Insurgent Midwest, Transnational Dialogues for a Humane Urbanism, led by our own Farhan Akhmar Aftab, a professor of urban and regional planning here at the University of Illinois. Her argument, Insurgent Midwest focuses on the American West as a site of locally situated but transnationally networked forms of insurgent and transformative social movements. Our preliminary explorations reveal the Midwest as a node in a network of transnational organizing and mobilizing practices from below that develop in opposition to the global, political, and economic processes that are unequally and evenly restructured from above across the urban landscapes of the traditional Midwest. Our interest in the Midwest as a site of transnational insurgent practices emerges through the struggles waged by homeless and jobless inhabitants of marginalized urban places. These groups form alliances and solidarity between workers, tenants, and indebted homeowners across national and sectoral divides to create a different world, one more responsive to their lived realities. 
grounded in their insurgent practices and shared struggles, and relying on their translocal and transborder alliances, these movements are opening the way for new forms of cross-sectoral and transnational solidarity, particularly in the, in the areas of shelter and work and activism. They combine struggles for decent housing for all with struggles for decent wages for work. Moreover, they connect their struggles to the global south of the Midwest with those of the dis possess communities in the global south elsewhere, particularly in South Africa and Mexico. And in fact, um, just last weekend, Faranox Group had its first conference here on campus where they brought together um, activists and scholars from Mexico, South Africa, Chicago, and Illinois to talk about these questions. You'll see that the principal investigators for these um, uh, projects range from the English professor to the history professor to the regional planner to the art and design professor. And each team contains a similarly plural, heterogeneous uh, group like that. I hope you can see from those examples how the, wi the wide variety of ways that a humanities without walls model draws on the strength of traditional humanities expertise and skills to drive transformations in how we think about sustainable innovation. You can hear in the project abstracts a set of arguments for cross-disciplinary co collaboration, as well as a persistent challenge to self-evident framings of contemporary questions. Indeed, the questions themselves, migration, water, urbane environments, are precisely always up for grabs in these renditions. They are a kind of uneven dynamic surface across which the researchers deploy their multimodal methods and seek to create new methodologies for apprehending what look like self-evident challenges and easy fixes as well. You may be tempted in your deliberations yesterday and today to ask, how does the world change if you introduce new technologies for air and water management, food and security, and the cure for cancer into various local, regional, and global environments? A humanist perspective allows you to think that question backwards and forwards by asking, what do we need to know about how those environments came to be what they are? and how the technologies we seek themselves are saturated in those cultural contexts, historical legacies, linguistic patterns, and imaginative cosmologies. What difference can and should that knowledge make in future to how we design our research and hypothesize possible outcomes in sustainable ways, in ways that will not be outstripped or outrun by the realities that people live on the ground every day? As Alice Walker, the African-American poet riffing off Rilke says, we must learn to love the questions themselves, like locked rooms full of treasure to which our blind and groping key does not yet fit. Humanists offer not simply pathways of connectivity to those questions. They promise to help develop and navigate the very tools for the kind of conductivity in and through the grand challenges that we all want to solve. So. The next time the lights go out, by all means, head to the circuit breaker and flip them back on. But please take a few humanists with you so we can work on keeping the lights on and knowing how, why, and under what conditions we need to do so together. In other words, lock arms with a few good humanists and let's save the planet. Thank you.
and I don't know where this is going as a question, but I guess I would say, how do you, uh, in terms of locking arms with social scientists and other scientists, how do you navigate that value explicitness that seems so clear in the work that the community brings that? How does that trickle down to the rest of the research project? Well, there's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that you identified something very important, and you call it value explicitness and um, value orientation. I guess humanists might also call it um, a skepticism about disinterested anything. Um, which is not to say that we're all evil because of what we want to do, but rather that we occupy specific positions that help to frame the way we see things, both at a very micro level, as in, you know, your training in X, Y, and Z, but also <laughs> at a more systemic level, your location in a public research university and all that. <coughs> and I think that um, that, that self-awareness is extremely humbling and important, and that that kind of humility, frankly, um, I mean, the HUM and humanist and the HUM and humility are not necessarily overlapping, because there are many egomaniacs in the humanities and anywhere else. But as a posture of knowledge production, or out of which knowledge production stems, I think it's very important. Um, in terms of that dynamic <coughs> interaction with your communities, I can only revert to my training as a British Empire historian and my understanding of how big global systems work, and that is that if you do arrive with your toolkit of expert knowledge in the local community and ask how can we apply this, you will be like any colonial missionary in any British imperial outpost. Um, and you need to be aware of that, as you are, of that long legacy uh, in, the, in, the, in the global humanitarian sphere of imperialism of all kinds, and you need to have models that are from the get-go um, abstractly dialogic and dynamic and reactive, but also models that take seriously the deep <coughs> histories, both deep in the sense of vertical, but also a long time <coughs> and more recent, of the ways in which the forces that you're interested in have played that You have to have local knowledge, not in a fetishizing or an ugly anthropological way, but in a meaningful and humble way. And you have to prepare to be you know, backwards and to and to have your method blown up by what's happening on the ground, I think. I have a process question. So uh, tell about how many emails you get every day. <laughs> um, and how many things you turn down every day. How do you make space? Um, how do we make space so that we have opportunities to make these kinds of cross-disciplinary connections when so much of uh, the academy today is set up uh, to focus on outputs that are just, <coughs> our eyes are on this prize that are you know, eight and ten and twelve and thirty minutes down the road. How do we make the time today to begin to develop and cultivate these the kinds of relationships that makes it safe to collaborate? So I'm going to pick a couple of pragmatic but also philosophical and sort of structural question uh, responses to that. I mean, one is that you have to prioritize, you cannot do everything, you have to prioritize what is important to you, and if you don't create a space for it yourself, no one will do it for you. So, to be honest, um, I create the space for this um, because I think it's incredibly important, and I want to share what we're doing, I want to pull it out of the precincts of IPRH and bring it in front of you, this distinguished um, international community, um, so that you are actually aware. So I think you have to kind of decide what you're going to make the space and time for. I think that um, at another slightly higher level, um, you know, humanities without walls is necessary in that regard. Um, it, its purpose is to launch a set of experiments in interdisciplinary collaboration across institutions of the kind that humanists just don't engage in. And the ethic of the of the foundation, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, and of the grant itself is one of risk and experimentation. So Mellon is as interested, patently and openly, in the failures as in the successes. And there have been unsuccesses in this project. These are lovely. There are beautiful commodities and projects. But there are there are teams that have not worked. There has been breakdown for all kinds of structural reasons. People have left. The infrastructure in one place is not the same as the infrastructure because we can't get the money to them uh, far enough. To be honest, if she were here, I know she would say she pulled that intrusion request out of fire because she had arguments with the people, the activists in, in Chicago, and they couldn't get along with the activists in Cape Town. And so 
I mean, there's all kinds of there's all kinds of friction along the way that is not going to be dismissed as or hidden um, as a kind of um, unfortunate cost of this. We want to hear everything. We want the full ethnography of this scene. And in that sense, um, I, I would be so bold as to say that Mellon is not the same as the NSF or the NIH or other federal funding um, opportunities, which you know set the tone of the problem straight up. And you have to respond to that, and you have deliverables that must be must be delivered, and there's not a kind of experimental character to that. So Mellon in the private foundation has the luxury of doing that, and there are certainly some dangers to private philanthropy and all the rest. Um, but I do think that the spirit in which um, these things are funded also helps to shape um, the ways, the, the postures and the orientations of the projects themselves. Setting up a innovative college of medicine, right? So you know, there's a lot that you should actually have uh, people that are interested and have expertise in helping us, right? Set up something that would intersect the European community. America, which is actually, uh, for whatever reason, right, humanity has not been a major part of medical education for the past hundred years. And to actually get this to work, actually, you have to cross a lot of cultural barriers. Medical educators are not used to the concept of bringing humanists in the fold. You need to be convinced that it's at that, right? And, and the students, too, right? Their main mission is to get the license, right? Pass the court exam and so on. Anything that's not relevant in their mind that this is going to help them score high in the court exam is going to be right, the target in terms of attention. So, how do you actually? Use some initial approach to go over those differences. So well, that's the, that's the great experimental project that King and I are involved in, yeah. right? Um, one of the things that you do is that you empower um, a historically unempowered segment of medical humanities on this campus to come to a full throated kind of self understanding of who they are and what they have to offer and have that expertise recognized by the local community inside the constraints and parameters of the LC. Totally get that, uh, the, the licensing board. Um, but you think about um, how to set up that relationship so it's not antagonistic, so it's not colonized or colonized, and so that the true richness of both ecosystems can intersect where they can and can run parallel where they must. So I think you have a kind of realistic but vigorous ambition for what this can look like, and you design it accordingly. And it's going to take some time, but We've already locked arms, uh, King and I, and um, our faculty and his people who work with him, and we're really excited about what that kind of, there are going to be some frictions along yeah. the way. Um, and, and we, I'm not, I study friction. I, I study the empire from below. So I study resistance, challenge, everything. So I'm, I'm in for it. Um, and I think that out of friction comes new knowledge. And hopefully not, um, you know, you don't want anybody to, to walk away. You want to keep everybody at the table. So we need to work hard um, methodologically on that as well. It's just a perfect beginning for today. Good. Uh,